Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Ryan Poor. I'm a PS, uh, marketing manager for the PSG marketing team. Uh, with us today is Rob Schnepp, the author and lead editor for Hazardous Materials Awareness and Operations 4th Edition. And he's he's gonna take you through a, a walkthrough of everything you should know about this new title. Just to give you an idea of what the agenda for this is going to look like, so Rob's going to start talking a little bit about his background as long as as well as the uh, NFPA 470 consolidation process. Then he's going to talk through a little bit of the textbook, including what's new. Um, we will show what we call the revision document, which includes a ch list of all chapter by chapter changes within this edition. Um, we'll open it on the webinar so you can see it, but we have also include put it in the handouts tab on your go to uh, control panel so you can access it there. And we'll also send it out in the follow up email once the webinar is done. And then Rob's going to talk a little bit about use cases, including, you know, who uses the book and why you should use it over other editions options in the market. And then last but not least, we're going to do a quick walkthrough of the Navigate packages, which Laura Carney, our product, one of our product owners, will take you through. And then we'll finish with time for Q&A. Um, just before we get started, two quick things. If you have any questions that come up during the webinar, you can put them in the questions box. And if we, if me or someone on my team can answer it while, the web, while mm -hmm. Rob is uh, presenting, we'll try to. Otherwise, we'll get to it during the uh, Q&A at the end. And you will be able to unmute yourself during the Q&A if you want to speak up too. Also, when the webinar ends today, we will have a brief survey. Um, if you could just take a couple minutes to complete that, we would greatly appreciate it. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Rob. Take it away, Rob. Okay, Ryan, thanks very much. And uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to give me a few minutes to talk about the uh, the textbook. And uh, to give you some perspective on uh, on the writing piece of this, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. So I spent 30 years in the fire service, uh, mostly here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I uh, worked uh, all the way up from a recruit firefighter to a, uh, a captain, and a, uh, I ended my career as the special operations chief here. Uh, but all during that time, I was a hazmat responder, uh, worked as a responder in the field, and then a program manager, and then the, uh, the chief that dealt with uh, our, both of our uh, hazmat rigs and all of our hazmat response throughout uh, the greater Bay Area. We're also certified as a type one team in California. We were one of the first five or six teams to get our certification. So I've been around the world really and literally uh, doing hazmat response with uh, foreign governments through the Department of Defense and all across the United States doing um, consulting and training with various fire departments and was on the speaking circuit with uh, for a number of years at the uh, IAFF uh, or IAFC Hazmat Conference and, and a number of the larger conferences there. So I've had a lot of interaction with fire agencies globally. Uh, also did a lot of work with the, uh, the original days of uh, the hazards of fire smoke with the um, Fire Smoke Coalition. And I bring that up because chapter seven talks about responder health and safety, and that's as a result of uh, all the work and all the input that uh, I encountered along the way there. It's not in the standard, but I uh, felt it was an important piece to include in the book so that uh, we would get a hazmat perspective on the dangers of fire smoke. Uh, also, worked as a paramedic for a number of years, so what comes through in the book hopefully is uh, some of the, the toxicological aspects. I was certified as a toximedic as well a number of years ago, so uh, treated a number of chemical exposures throughout my career and, and had the opportunity to see that, that nexus between uh, emergency care in the field and uh, hazardous materials response. I also did a lot of work with uh, what was called Urban Shield, which is the largest homeland security exercise in the country, and uh, that brought together hazmat teams in a a competitive format from all over the greater Bay Area and Northern California. And so I had a lot of exposure to a bunch of different teams that were uh, some industry based, mostly public safety and some law enforcement teams as well. And so I say all that really to tell you that the book's written from the perspective of seeing how hazmat response is done all over the world uh, and to bring that hopefully out in the writing of this. And last but not least, uh, the, the time that I spent on the NFPA uh, what was called the, the 472 committee before the revision here, which includes uh, included at that time 472, 473, uh, 1072. You may remember the old 471, 
uh, and the new 475, uh, which was also modeled after the Special Operations Program Management um, uh, program that you can find at the National Fire Academy. I was one of the developmental um, contributors for that as well. So been in the business a long time and been on the committee a long time. And I think what those two things uh, give you as the reader and the user of the book is a perspective of uh, someone who's worked in the field and worked with the committee for a number of years and a number of revision cycles. So I got a good idea uh, and, and hopefully the, uh, the, some of the, the inside workings of, of how hazmat uh, regulations and how the 470 committee works. So a bit about the book then. Uh, so in this revision cycle, it was a little odd because uh, COVID number one, and so our meetings on the 470 committee were uh, virtual and uh, the, the move that the NFPA has taken on a number of different standards to consolidate um, uh, all the different elements of, of one technical committee into one document. NFPA 470 is a great example, also NFPA 1990 the uh, standard on personal protective equipment were two pretty large initiatives that helped to consolidate all those those all those the collection of standards into one uh, place one uh, location where you can go and access all that different material so a lot of the effort in this revision cycle was was really the heavy lifting of the consolidation and i can tell you from a committee perspective it wasn't just a cut and paste uh, of putting all those documents together there was a lot of effort put into the consistency uh, between those standards. So when you looked at the old way it was laid out, you had NFPA 472, uh, which was the hazmat standard for, for all different parts of the discipline, awareness operations, technician, incident commander, and all the different specialties. And 473, uh, I'm the task group chair for that, uh, was the EMS part, the emergency medical services part of hazmat and uh, the point of that particular uh, piece of, of the committee was to integrate hazmat response and EMS. And since I had a long background uh, as a paramedic and a tox medic, uh, I was asked to be the chair of that particular group. And uh, so what you'll find in NFPA 473 is, is how to take your hazmat training with you uh, to a medical call if you're a paramedic or an EMT or, or even higher. And then 1072, as you may know, is the JPR, um, the job performance requirements that are, are really the, the knowledge and skill check and the hands-on piece of, of the standard of 472, of old 472. And so when you look at all of those standards, the way it currently sits in this revision cycle is the new document is called NFPA 470. And it's it the, the key phrase here is consolidation. And what I mean by that is that those three key standards were incorporated into the book uh, with an eye on NFPA 1072. Many states and uh, state training programs are adopting the JPR format uh, through the Pro Qualification Board and, and others. And so it, it's one place to, to go and find all these documents. And so there's a number of chapters and the, the layout of 470 is somewhat similar to the chapter layout of the of the older documents but it's not exact and so what i would tell you about the document is if you go to nfpa's website uh, and you look at 470 you'll see chapter by chapter layout so you'll see chapters on operations you'll see chapters on awareness you'll see chapters on uh, on technician uh, so the really again the heavy lifting was uh was in the consolidation process now 475 is outside of this it still stands alone as its own document. Uh, so when you look into it, you won't find 475 there. Uh, another big piece of that is uh, when you think about hazmat response, uh, personal protective equipment is a really big piece of it. And uh, the NFPA 1990 uh, standard underwent or uh, went through the same sort of process that 470 did uh, in terms of consolidating all those PPE standards that were there. And so really, when you look at sort of the heart of hazmat response, 470 and 1990 would be the documents that you'll, you'll look at. And as you know, the textbook just handles awareness and operations. Those are the two foundational levels of training for pretty much anybody entering the hazmat business uh, or hazmat response, whether it's industry or uh, whether it's public safety. 
And uh, there are also mission specific chapters in there, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But you have the core competencies of awareness and operations, and the books arranged so that you can sequentially and logically follow the flow of training. And and when you think about the the hierarchy of training, whether it's through OSHA uh, or it's through NFPA, you you do awareness, then operations, and those are foundational for technician and specialist. And so the read of the book uh, as you go through it is the first chapters are awareness, the, the next chapters are operations, and then there's the uh, somewhat the transitional chapter on responder health and safety, as I mentioned before, with uh, fire smoke, and then uh, the mission specific competencies. And uh, all those, all the content is mapped out to the JPRs. So you can rest assured this is the, the fourth edition of the book, uh, and the last two have been mapped to JPRs. And there's many states that have gone through it line by line to ensure that there's consistency and, and accuracy in the in the what I'll call the parent content uh, of of the nuts and bolts of the of the tasks and the competencies for awareness and operations, and then how those are folded into the JPRs, uh, which used to be in in 1072. Also, the uh, skill drills and the objectives are also mapped to the standard. So, the key thing about a book uh, about based on a standard is that it, it's compliant and it's comprehensive with with all the pieces and the the writing of the book I can tell you has uh, as it's been written it's been viewed by many people on the committee uh, many people in law enforcement uh, who've looked at the um, the evidence uh, collection and uh, the other chapters that, that intersect with law enforcement so there's been a lot of eyes on the, the chapters as it's gone through its iterations uh, both for content but also for uh, mapping back to the standard. You'll also find in this edition knowledge checks, which are there to to reinforce some of the key points in each of the chapters uh, and also give you and instructors, if you happen to be an instructor, a way to start and stimulate discussions with your uh, students and participants uh, in order for you to, to double check that they're actually getting the material and understanding it. And I'll also mention that the, the book won the Ben Franklin a writing award in 2012 that was issued from the National uh, Fire Heritage Center. So it's uh, it's been out there and been looked at by a number of different people. And uh, and I think that ensures the quality and the consistency and the comprehensive nature of the content. So the, the book is used uh, really globally uh, a lot in North America. There are um, uh, people outside of the U.S. and entities outside of the U.S. that use it. But if you had to really summarize it, it's it's public safety, uh, industry uses it, and the military. Uh, for this reason is that many people who work on sites where there are chemicals or there's chemical processes or there's hazardous waste, uh, there's some level of training that needs to be done. And awareness is really the most foundational level of training that's out there. And uh, many people that do not directly respond or they're not responsible necessarily for mitigating hazmat incidents or or handling the materials they they need that basic level of training and operations is is really somewhat the bread and butter for responders uh, law enforcement officers uh, fire departments you know many people that go through a, a fire academy uh, get basic uh, hazmat operations uh, you'll see that in ambulance companies uh, some hospitals will use it as well and uh, throughout the military. So it's really awareness and operations are, are the springboard for higher levels of training, number one, but uh, it's also really uh, allows people to take some basic actions uh, whenever their job requires it. And also, uh, this book and the standard allows for a lot of flexibility when it comes to the mission-specific competencies. And so the that whole idea was was hatched years ago with uh, after September 11th, really, to give uh, teams and individuals and jurisdictions the ability to to flex the ability of operations level people to expand their scope of practice uh, somewhat. So an awareness person with some of the mission specific competencies is not a replacement for a technician, uh, but it's a way for uh, an AHJ, uh, the authority having jurisdiction, to uh, to extend what operations level uh, responders can do. And now, having said that, they, there are some criteria for 
operations level responders to to operate in that fashion and it, it really is under the jurisdiction of a hazmat technician or under the the supervision and authority of a technician so all that's laid out in the first chapter of the book uh, where you can understand how an AHJ can use the standard and understand the book and how it maps to the standard to plan how they want to format and structure their response and their responders so uh, again there's there's JPRs and they're all tied to the awareness and operations. This is not a technician book. Um, it doesn't move into that realm. Uh, it's not heavy on uh, a lot of chemistry that you find in technician and or specialist. And so uh, the other part of this is in the, the fundamentals book, there's uh, nine chapters of, of this textbook moved over into that uh, textbook as well. Again, because many fire academies use uh, the, the core competencies for awareness and operations in their fire academy. So you'll see it in a couple of different places as a standalone in this book and also as a, 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 I'll say a component of the fundamentals book. So a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, so when you think about hazmat training and the laws and, and uh, standards that govern it, there's, there's two big players. There's OSHA, obviously. Uh, and then there's NFPA, and OSHA still remains the the law governing uh, how we respond to hazmat incidents. And NFPA is a very well respected and implemented uh, guideline. But there are a couple of differences to to keep in mind. So number one is uh, the OSHA standard written in '89 hasn't been revised since then, and it's very basic and and somewhat Spartan in its um, in how it's laid out. And NFPA is, goes into great detail on the tasks and competencies that uh, are out there. And what I will tell you is, as the revision cycle every five years in NFPA comes up, it, it's really been able to keep pace with reality in terms of hazmat response. Uh, everyone on the committee has been a practitioner in their perspective, in their uh, respective disciplines, and there's a lot of experience in the 30-some people that are on that particular committee. And so every year there's new things that come out and uh, new techniques and new thinking and new rationale behind response and a lot of changes in terminology uh, that you'll see in this edition as well. But a key thing to keep in mind is that OSHA considers awareness level um, people, I will say, uh, as responders. So in, the, in OSHA world, awareness people are responders, which means they can be tasked to respond to, to go out to uh, a scene. NFPA looks at it as awareness uh, people are personnel, not necessarily tasked to respond. And, and that's a fundamental difference in the two uh, entities and how they view that basic level of training. And so when you, when you think about it from an NFPA perspective, the the awareness level is somewhat of a um, when we think about it, it's it's recognizing that a situation could be potentially dangerous or or there's some thing going on with a chemical release and that other people should be called to mitigate that. And so awareness level personnel are really not expected to or required to go in and, and do anything specific other than move away and and respond or, or call other people to respond. Uh, in OSHA world again they are responders and they can they can do some certain things that are mostly defensive uh, oriented so but awareness is a very common level of training for a, a, a people just to understand how to use the emergency response guidebook and how to understand what the capabilities of the jurisdiction are and so i just wanted to point that out that that you will see in the book personnel used when we talk about awareness you won't see it that's attached to the word responder and that doesn't happen until we get to the operations uh, level in both standards really operations is the fundamental first place to go for uh, defensive operations uh, until or unless you get into the mission specific and so as a, a jurisdiction may decide we will train all of our whatever they are law enforcement ems fire service to the core competencies of operations and then the ahj again the authority having jurisdiction may decide well we would like to add personal protective mass decontamination technical decontamination and maybe evidence collection to it and so it's a a la carte menu 
uh, of things that an authority having jurisdiction might decide that the operations level uh, responders need to, to do to expand how they uh, operate on the scene. And again, uh, technician is not covered in this book, so you won't find anything other than tangential um, references to the technician level. And again, the revision cycles are pretty different, and I think this is an important piece that uh, as the standard is revised, the book is revised. Again, OSHA hasn't had any revision since uh, the 80s, and so what you, what you don't see is a lot of new content coming out in the law. So let's let's get to what's new. And uh, again, the the revision cycle here was largely centered on uh, making sure there was consistency in all the documents, making sure that the consolidation process was correct, uh, making sure the mapping back to 1072 in each of those competencies was there, and also uh, adding some new terminology. Uh, some things that, quite frankly, had just been missing from the standard for years and some things that were new in terms of thinking and, and the way that the, the book is arranged. So some of the key updates, and, and just as an aside, that, that cover photo there was one I took. That's, that's one of our, uh, um, that's our team in the Bay Area at Urban Shield, actually, uh, doing the, a, a scenario work there. And so uh, many of the pictures that you see in the book were taken by myself or uh, other people who are responders in the field. And I really wanted to get action photos as much as possible so that you could see the point that was being made illustrated by a photo that was taken hopefully on a real scene or if not in a, in, in a realistic training environment. So uh, Ryan, if you could scroll, scroll down to the chapters there. So I'll walk you through some of the changes here. So in, in chapter one, and what I will say is that there was a lot of rearranging in this book because as as the standard, uh, as the consolidation happened, it was an opportunity to introduce some new terminology and the the new chapter 15 on radiological response uh, was a bit of a game changer because it, it took and, and required us to change some of the uh, information that was in the body of operations and move it over into that particular chapter. So there was some a, a number of things that needed to be deleted here and moved over to there. And you'll also see that in some of the chapters, PPE and, and decontamination especially, uh, what I opted to do was to, was to meet the intent of the standard in the core competency standard. But because there was some natural duplication there, I, I didn't want to have the reader have to read the same thing twice. And so some of that material was was moved into the mission specific competency. And you'll see references in the book that say, you know, here are the basics that are laid out in the standard for PPE, for example. And then for more information, or if you want to get more, you may not be necessarily uh, adhering to the PPE mission specific competency, but that was where a lot of the information, uh, additional information could be found. So you will see some pointing back and forth between the mission specific and the core competencies just so that the reader doesn't have to go through and, and see it twice in two different places. So one thing in chapter one there, there were some, some new photos that uh, we chose to put in there, but you'll also see there's some uh, definitions on non-intervention and what defensive and offensive modes mean. Over the years, we talked about each of those, but it just never really made it into the standard. So you'll see that there. Uh, and you also see offensive, you know, defensive strategy and tactics. That was a piece that was missing there. And so a formal definition of strategy and tactics. Uh, chapter two was updated with the new ERG sorts of uh, information that comes out. That book uh, is revised on a, on a regular basis as well. So we have to make sure that the images and the references are all similar. Uh, same thing with the, uh, the, the NFPA system. And so that chapter was was retooled a lot with uh, content moved around just to make it a little more reader friendly. Uh, chapter three was um, also there's that was where radiation intersected a lot with the chapter 15. And so that that chapter was completely uh, changed due to the inclusion now of chapter 15 on radiation. Uh, chapter four, there's some new. Uh, 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 images in there. There's also uh, terminology changes you might have seen 
uh, about non-pressure, pressure, and and um, low pressure containers. That's the old MC 306, you know, 307 uh, sort of thing. And so you'll see some different terminology in there. Uh, chapter five, there was a quite a bit of new material in there and a lot of moving different things around. There was talk about decontamination, and that goes back to where I mentioned if you would like more information on technical decon, you can go to the mission specific chapter. Even though that may not be a mission specific competency you are going to be certified to, at least you can go there and get more and in different information. A lot of changes with NFPA 1990. There was a lot of terminology changes because when you think about the old standard on PPE, you had NFPA 1991, 1992, 1993, 1994. Again, those were all consolidated to 1990. And so the references back to all the PPE uh, was was a, a pretty heavy lift in terms of making sure that the, the references back and forth to vapor protective ensembles, you know, old level A terminology, splash protection level B, and how that all mapped back to NFPA 1990. So that that's a pretty big chapter uh, in terms of, of rearranging and new content as it relates to NFPA 1990. Chapter six uh, talks a lot about how to implement the plan response. That's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of, of setting up and, and thinking through uh, some basic risk assessment and uh, uh, determining how you'll approach uh, uh, an incident from a tactical and strategic standpoint. And so there's a pretty good amount of information in there about how to do it. And one thing you'll notice in the book is that there's there's not a lot of step one, two, three, four kind of thing. There's conceptually, these are the steps that you need to take. And and quite frankly, big differences are all across the country. When you when you look at hazmat response teams, uh, or you look at law enforcement or emergency medical services, there's all kinds of differences in protocols and equipment and you know, mutual aid and how teams interact with each other. And, you know, they don't do it the same in, in one state as they do another or in Canada as they do here. And so there's there's a lot of latitude in into determining the finer points of how you will implement things against the concepts and the ideas of how to do it from a, a safe perspective, number one but how tactically to approach it. And, and my philosophy in, in the book, I will just say, is, 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 is understanding what your problem is and then knowing what your resource set is and how to deploy solution against problem. And you know, I've, I've been to a whole lot of asthmat incidents and never been to the same one two times in a row. So you know, it, a rolled over tanker truck on the freeway, completely different circumstances because of weather and the environment and time of day and wind directions and all those sorts of things. And so really, hopefully when you read the book from beginning to end, it gives you the tools you need to think your way through the problem. We'll move down to seven there. So again, seven was uh, responder health and safety, and that really focuses on exposures and uh, exposures to smoke and field decontamination. And, and back in the early days, mostly in the fire service, there was uh, fires were not thought of in really a, a, a hazardous materials thought process. And uh, if you think about it, if you any of our uh, viewers here come from the fire service, you know, a working structure fire is, is probably the one of the nastiest hazmat incidents you'll go to uh, just because of the number of chemical compounds that are released. And so uh, we felt like back in the previous edition, it would be a benefit to understand what those hazards are how to mitigate them, processes of field decontamination, uh, how to deal at a basic level with chemical exposures from uh, fire smoke, that sort of thing. But that that does not really end up in the standard uh, much. There are some talks about uh, field decontamination, field expedient decontamination, um, but but this is a kind of a bonus chapter for uh, for the readers. Eight is PPE, and again, it's important to understand that operationally there are a, a set of things that that nfpa tasks and competencies that are laid out for you the reader to understand as to be an operations level person the mission specific competency goes into much more detail about uh, care and maintenance of personal protective equipment uh, the interactions between 
what used to be 1991, two, three, and four, and and what it looks like now in the in the new iteration, and really how to understand personal protective equipment. That's one of the most important choices that is made on a scene, and uh, and to understand not just well we wear the green suit for this or we wear the blue suit for that, but to really understand you know what it means to be NFPA certified for uh, a, a vapor protective garment and and those sorts of things. So uh, again basic in operations, expanded and mission specific. Uh, chapter nine really didn't change much. Mass Decon uh, is, is a, a fairly straightforward chapter and there's some new images, but for the most part, it was uh, really left alone. Uh, product control is the same thing. Uh, not a lot of changes in there or uh, detection and monitoring devices. There's some new images in there, but the what you don't see is any specific nod toward a device or uh, a manufacturer. What you see is uh, more about technology. And when, when you read that chapter, hopefully what you'll take from it is, is how to look at your own detection and monitoring uh, stable of devices and what technologies they represent. And my hope is that you'll look at the book and understand what the technologies are capable of and then would that work for you? Uh, does your AHJ need that? It doesn't need perhaps that device, but it needs that technology. And so uh, for me, I had I had two hazmat rigs. We had uh, two of the seven national laboratories in the country in my response district. And so we had two type one uh, certified hazmat rigs in the state of California. And, and so there were some requirements there, but we also viewed the, the, uh, purchase and the upkeep and maintenance and the investment in the in the detection and monitoring equipment which is no small uh, financial investment and figure out where are the gaps in technology and so hopefully that came through in the book is that we're not we're not really here to buy that that widget I'll call it we're here to to plug up that hole in our technology arsenal to make sure that we can do what we need to do um, when we get out there on some of these complex scenes uh, victim rescue and recovery, largely unchanged, uh, as well as illicit laboratories, which is uh, chapters 13 and 14. Now, one of the biggies that you'll see uh, in this iteration is in uh, the radiological chapter, chapter 15. Uh, that was new this year, uh, along with the consolidation, and it's a, it's a quite comprehensive chapter, I will say. There's a lot of really good information in there. It's, it's pretty high level for operational level uh, responders, and it goes into a lot of detail about uh, setting zones and, and what, are, what are action levels and that sort of thing. And a lot of it is as a recommendation because, again, one jurisdiction might adopt this set of protocols versus this set of protocols. And so it's really hard to, to say this is the number for your jurisdiction. And, uh, again, that's the... Uh, one of the beautiful things about the NFPA approach in it is that it it gives the AHJ the ability to think about what the hazard and risk assessment would be in your jurisdiction and or your mutual aid area or whatever. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you've got a, a rail spur that's bringing crude oil through and into a, a, a production facility and that's new for you. Well, the basic training may require you or your AHJ may choose to expand the scope of the operations level responder simply because you got a new threat or a new hazard in your jurisdiction. So flexibility, uh, again, is really important in this radiological chapter is a way to add that piece to the response program so that if for some reason your jurisdiction really believes that that a higher level of rab response is needed and and your people need to be trained to a higher level that uh, chapter is now there uh, down to 16 uh, is evidence preservation and sampling uh, there's been some revisions in the case uh, study and uh, there's some terminology changes not anything uh, too big there but i will tell you that that 14 and 16 uh, chapters 14 and 16 again were peer-reviewed by law enforcement personnel that were on the committee at the time uh, and also uh, just had a, a good scrutiny from people that were actually doing the job.
but people that help to craft the standard and the language in the standard from a, a law enforcement perspective and, and to make sure that everything was correct. And I will tell you, it's personally for me is to make sure that the book is accurate was always a big piece of this and this is the fourth edition so this is the fourth time we've we've tried to do that is to make sure that the book is accurate number one to make sure it's fully compliant with the standard number two to make sure it's it's easy to read and or interesting to read number three and that that you can put take it into action you can find some actionable information there whether you're an instructor or your uh, your your responder so uh, the book grows with each iteration and each of the um, revision cycles has had some important thing that has caused the book to change its format or its structure uh, or the images are updated. Uh, it, we didn't really have the ability to do as much of that because of COVID this year. That was an impact on imagery in the book. Uh, but we try to keep it as as current as possible with the current thinking, current material, current um, shots of personal protective equipment and, and current shots of detection and monitoring and that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, on to the use case thing, so, or a piece of this. So when you think about it, again, public safety, this is really bread and butter for, for new recruits in, in a lot of different arenas, but really uh, to, to to be a responder of some form and to know that you could come across the hazmat incident almost any time, uh, and they're not overt. Uh, I've stumbled many times into things that were one thing and it turns out to be another. You know, medical aid turns into it's a working drug lab or a fire turns into a, 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 a garage fire that's been used to store all kinds of weird chemicals and things that the person has collected. And so it really is a public safety staple for awareness and operations. And when you think about it, you know, fire service is clearly a, a big user, but as I mentioned, industry and law enforcement and uh, EMS as well. But when you think about fire service use cases, there's 30,000 fire departments in the U.S. and, and around 70 percent of it is volunteer. And so we've got uh, agencies uh, out in rural areas that uh, at some time, again, had large production facilities dropped right in the middle of, of uh, their their uh, real estate out there. And whether it's a gigantic data center getting built uh, or it's, it's uh, again, a rail spur that's processing oil or distribution facilities or whatever it happens to be, uh, it, it's changed the game a bit for, for some of the volunteer agencies that, that serve predominantly a rural population. And again, any person tasked to respond uh, really needs to be trained and, and and mostly it's for your own safety really when you think about it it's the ability to to have that ability to see the incident differently and to be able to understand what's really happening out there and to know uh, to me is is as much about when not to take action as it is when to take action and to know when you're sort of you know over your head in terms of what the problem is presenting and so it, it really is a at the end of the day, yes, it's about responding and mitigating the problem, but it's really about how you view it and, and how the, the, the safety of the responders is paramount. And safety comes from knowledge and information and the ability to, to format and to formulate an opinion based on what you're seeing against what you were, you were trained. And so this really is a good foundational level for anybody who's out there in the field. The other piece of this, uh, which is important is that when you look at the OSHA standard, what it says is that anybody who would take command of a hazmat incident past operations level, so meaning it was something that required technicians to come in and resolve, uh, there must be specific incident commander training. And according to OSHA, it's 16 hours plus being operational level trained, which means by default you would have been awareness level trained. And this is a big gap in in training uh, all across the country. So you're a, a battalion chief, for example, in a metropolitan fire department, and you've got a hazmat team that's working. Well, that incident commander should be trained to operations and then trained to incident command to be fully compliant with the law. And so 
this again is why operations is so important because it's it again is it's a foundational building block for technician it's a foundational building block for mission specific add-ons and it's a fun foundational building block for the command of hazmat incidents and so anybody who's watching this uh, your your command staff whatever that means and looks like uh, if they're expected to command something past operations then they really need to be trained uh, to operations in order to do that awesome thanks rob so right before we get into q a uh one of our product owners, Laura Carney, is going to take you through a quick walkthrough of the Navigate packages available for the fourth edition. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks, Rob. We offer a variety of resources to help support both the instructor and the student. Our Navigate package offerings include both an Advantage and a Premier version. The Advantage package includes the textbook, ebook, lecture outlines, learning objectives, slides, videos, flashcards, test bank, skill evaluation sheets, and skill drill review slides. The premier version includes these same resources, plus is further enhanced with test prep and interactive lectures. For instructor support, we offer an online instructor toolkit as well as a test bank. All right, so now we're gonna open it up for Q&A. Um, I do have a couple questions in the box that I'm actually gonna read out that came up during the uh, webinar, but I'm gonna give everybody the ability to unmute themselves. If you wanna speak up and ask a question, you can also, uh, if you don't wanna speak, you can also put any questions you have in the box. Um, Rob, I think this one's probably best for you, but one person, uh, Sean asked during, while you were speaking earlier, what is the go date for the new 470? Uh, it should be out. Um, yeah, you should be able to see it. Go to the N NFPA website. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't have an exact date, but I under uh, my impression is that it's already out. Got it. Cool. And then there was also a question saying, when we went from 472 to 1072 in Arizona, if SAC decided to require a 1072 certificate to be eligible to be certified as a firefighter one and two, does anyone have a pulse on the IFSAC response to a new standard 470? Will my students have to repeat the hazmat awareness and operations class again? That's what they had to do in 2020. Uh, this question may be outside this presentation, but wanted to see if someone has a feel for that. Uh, well, I can throw in on that. So the, the 1072 piece came in in the third edition, the revision. So that was really it's when it became a, a thing, I will say. Uh, so there was a lot of mapping back to the JPRs to to make sure that that was that was in fact the case. Now there really hasn't been a, a significant change in that, so I, I'm unaware if the decision is going to be that you have to repeat it. But my guess would be is that there's not a ton of new material in the, the standard that affects awareness and operations from a standard perspective. There's some new terminology and a few other things, so. You know, I would check with your AHJ. They'd obviously be the ones that would be able to tell you that, but uh, that's my two cents on it. And yeah, if anyone else has any questions, you can unmute yourself now and speak up or type it into the box and I'll keep an eye on that and read it out. Uh, I think a follow up to one of the questions uh, you just answered, Rob, October 17th, 1989. For uh, OSHA? Yeah, I, yeah. I think, I'm not 100% sure, but it just came into the box. I was just reading it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's plus or minus, but it's the year is uh, right. And uh, that was when the Haswopper standard uh, was first put into place. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting at that time because I was in the fire service at that time, and it was uh, it was a, a big deal back then because, you know, prior to that, we were washing gasoline down the drain and after car accidents and, you know, really didn't have a whole lot of savvy, I will say, in hazmat response. And uh, prior to that, in the late 70s, mid to late 70s into the 80s, uh, firefighters in particular were, were getting hurt on a pretty regular basis because we just weren't really thinking about it in that way. And so... We've come a long way in terms of the standard and 
and the standard way that we think and, and handle hazmat. So it's been a it's been a it was a good thing to get the discussion started and the training started, and then it's uh, matured and progressed quite a bit since then. So I'll do a one last call. If anyone has any questions, unmute yourself and speak up, or type them in the box. And as I mentioned earlier, um, there is a quick survey when you close out the webinar. If you do have any follow-up questions for Rob or someone from the uh, PSG team, you can also type a question in there and we'll work to follow up with you uh, after the webinar concludes. Yeah, and if I can just say before we close here is that thanks everybody for joining and uh, and thanks uh, Ryan and, and Laura for giving me the chance to have the discussion. I feel like it's a good use of time and, and really people understand some of the thinking behind the writing and and how the book is put together is is pretty important so hopefully everybody out there got a little something out of it and uh, you can move forward and and in, in, uh, understanding the book a little bit better awesome oh i think that date mentioned earlier was asking where you were for the earthquake Oh, the 89 earthquake? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was, at that time, I was working in uh, the city of Isalia, so we got dispatched up to uh, uh, a town called Watsonville to do some uh, post-earthquake sort of stuff. All right. Well, if no one has anything else, uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Rob, for your time to walk everyone through uh, the new edition. And like I said, we'll send out an email probably either tomorrow or Monday It'll have a recording with, of this webinar. Um, the PowerPoint deck will be included as well, and we'll include a couple other just PDFs about the book if you're looking to learn more. But uh, thanks again, Rob, and thanks to everyone for joining. Have a good rest of your Thursday. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Rob. Have a nice day. Thank you.